can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Ryan Tomlinson of Good or Marketing. And Ryan, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes of the podcast people should check out. Since this is part of the top agency series, I had uh, Duncan Alney on the podcast, actually. He specializes in CPG companies, and they do social for CPG companies. And we're going to talk, Ryan and I were talking before we hit record here about niches and uh, how he came to some of the niches that he serves. So that's a great one with Duncan. Another one uh, is Kevin Hergen. Kevin Hergen had an agency, you know, Ryan, you've been doing this for a long time. He had an agency back in 1995. And so it was interesting to hear just the uh, evolution of business, of the internet, and of agency life uh, back from 1995 to the present day. So that was a really good one. And Adi Clevitt's also a favorite one. She is an agency. She's a done for you service for SOPs for a company. So she, you know, people are looking at streamlining their onboarding for clients or staff. And she goes in and helps the company document those things. And we geeked out on her favorite software tools and productivity. So that's a good one to check out. More on inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? Uh, we do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. So we do the strategy, the accountability, and also the full execution behind the scenes. So, Ryan, we call ourselves kind of the magic elves that run in the background that make it look easy for the host so they can create amazing content, create amazing relationships, and most importantly, run their business. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships, and I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships, and I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. I'm excited to introduce Ryan Tomlinson. He's founder of Gooder Marketing. They're a web design agency that specializes in creating not only visually appealing sites, but also highly functional websites. And it really tailors to their clients' needs because they have all sorts of clients. You know, he started the agency back in 2011. They've helped anyone from property management companies to brokerage companies to junk removal companies to construction companies. They have like 16 pages of work that I was going through and looking through. So uh, check them out at goodermarketing.com. Ryan, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. So just start off and talk about Gooder Marketing and what you do. Also, for, there's going to be a video portion, and I'm going to share the, the website as Ryan's talking. Yeah, um, so Gooder Marketing is a digital agency. We focus on website development and internet marketing. Um, we have a, a full in-house team of four developers, a project management team, um, a design team, and then also a marketing team. So we do SEO, uh, social media, Google ads, um, and any other type of online marketing that uh, you may be interested in. And uh, yeah, we, we've got quite a bit of experience under our, our belt um and and really able to help a business um you know from whatever need they may have and if we can't help you know with our internal team then we often have a, a good resource of referral partners that we can find an expert for whatever the case may be and, and help our our clients out and that's what we strive to be is kind of a one-stop shop um you know we're never going to be experts at everything but um, we, we know our stuff and we also know who other exports are so we can bring in the needed uh, people for whatever the project may be to help out our clients. Talk about when you first started, what made you first start the agency? Well, um, 
I'll take it maybe a step even farther before we started the agency. So my introduction to kind of web design, web development, and marketing came in the age of the online poker boom. Um, so I, I was kind of interested in, in playing poker, and I was at a young age, so I didn't have a lot of expendable income to actually play anything. Uh, so I found myself looking for promotions here and there. and and something inside me asked, how are they able to give away these promotions? So I'm talking about they'd give me 50 bucks to come and it's play like free on the money. Poker. What's the what's the catch? Yeah. So as I started digging into that more and more, I found out um, the people that were giving away those promotions were actually getting a kickback for sending new players to online casinos and poker rooms and stuff like that, that paid more than the 50 bucks that they were giving away. So it was kind of a, a pretty good system that these 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 people had created. So um, I kind of took advantage of, of that idea and I started learning how to build my own websites to promote where to find the best poker bonuses or how to um, play uh, poker online or where to get the best sports book bonus. And I, I grew up a, probably a network of about 12, 15 websites um, about all these different topics. And so I kind of taught myself how to build them, design them, um, and most importantly, how to market them through SEO. And that was really my my strength um, throughout, well, even now, as, as SEO is, is my strength. Um, and as I did that, I, I found and I brought in team members. I suck at design, so I quickly found a designer to help us out and make the sites look better. Um, and then brought on a, a developer to help make them function better. And uh, at some point, I, I kind of, um, you know, lost, not lost interest, but kind of moved on. That I got to a peak where the, the boom was over and kind of the, the market was saturated. Um, so um, I took kind of all those skills of learning how to build my own site and rank it on the top for a very competitive keyword and started applying that to local businesses in my area and started building websites for clients and helping them rank you know tops of google and uh it was fairly easy because online gambling and poker was one of the most competitive keywords and then when i started helping out the local plumber it was like wow this is this is a lot easier <laughs> We'll talk about your first customer in a second for the agency, but what did life look like at that time when you were do building the sites? Were you just doing this on the nights and weekends and you had a separate job? What did what did your life look like at that time? Uh, all of this was kind of done at the end of high school and through college. Oh, so, so you were young. Um, I was, yeah, I was, I was a young, um, and, and it was paying enough for beer money at college and to do the fun things that I wanted to do in college. So it was kind of like my part-time ish job in, in college and, and gave me what I, I needed to do to, to get by. Um, and then it was after college where I got a co-op position and, and, um, with, uh, with another person. And, and that's when I kind of got into doing what I do now. Um, and it, yeah, it was just about a, after a year after college is where I kind of transitioned into what we are now. So talk about your first significant customer and how you got them. Uh, I would, I would say it's some of the first customers that we ever had, um, and we still have them today. So that means that we've been working with them for close to 15 years, which is impressive on their end to, you know, still be doing what they're doing. And, and I think also very impressive on our end that we've kept them happy uh, that they've continued to work with us for such a long period of time. Um, they're not my aunt or uncle or my significant family member. Though, so there's there's no reason that they have to stay with us uh, other than we we deliver good customer service and, and have provided what uh, they've, they've needed throughout the, the process. How did you get those first customers, right? You're, did you cold call? You knock on their door? What did you do? 
You know what? Um, I, I've been very fortunate, I think, with um, referrals. A lot of our business has come through referral base. Um, and and it's something that I continue to do in local networking, either at the chamber or in networking type groups is um, I get involved and, and uh, you know, people hear things and, and mention my name and, and things kind of circle back. And and so that's how we we got all of our clients at the beginning, um, and and still to this day, referral either from past clients or or people that know us in the community. Um, that is still today one of the biggest ways we get our our leads. So in the first in the beginning, you joined a lot of uh, different networking groups, and you kind of shook a lot of hands, and from there, just foster relationships and uh, more referrals. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't easy. Um, it's not my favorite situation to be in. Uh, I mean, I've grown into it, but definitely at the beginning, um, walking into a room, not knowing anyone, and and just saying, hi, my name is Ryan. Uh, I am the owner of Gooder Marketing, and we do this, this, and this. Uh, that was a little difficult, but, um, you know, you got to step outside your comfort zone at the beginning, for sure. In the beginning, t- just talk about the evolution of services on those first customers. Obviously, they've been with you for some of them, like for over a decade. What did you start doing with them? And then did you add on other services as time went by or do you have them all from the beginning? Uh, no, that's a, that's a great question because I think our clients also push us to grow and expand. So I'm not, uh, I don't like often saying, no, we can't do it and just close the door on it. Uh, even if we can't do it, I do like to introduce someone else that can to just keep helping in any way I can. But um, our, our first services were um, website design, SEO and way back when it was called Google uh, Works, well, Google G Suite. So Google has gone through so many different names, but basically Google Workspace is what it's called now. Um, and we were one of the very first to get into offering and reselling that service as well um, in our area. So we were switching a lot of companies over from their old, old web mail type thing that really had so many problems getting them over onto what is now Google Workspace. Um, so that was also another uh, foot in the door because at the time it was really wanted. It was fairly easy to sell, um, sometimes a little easier than trying to pitch SEO or marketing or a new website to clients because they they see the value of an upgraded email system for a relatively cheap cost. Um, and then again, once once we are able to help them with that and build a good rapport, um, then we can do other services for them when they may need it. I love that. And yeah, I can't remember the names because they've changed them a bunch of times. But um, yeah, it's really valuable for kind of professionalizing their their whole email system. And you said it's a foot in the door. How do you decide early on from like a pricing perspective? Because maybe you know, okay, from from that one in particular for the you know kind of upgrading their email because you go okay great we know they're gonna love us then they're gonna want the website they're gonna want the SEO and these other services how do you decide to price that initial kind of foot in the door based on on that? Um, I I I think we strive not to be the most expensive and not to be the cheapest so that that saying I think gets thrown around quite a bit. Um, although it's difficult sometimes to even know what those high levels and low levels are. Um, I mean, at the beginning, again, I was younger then, so I was as more eager and, and not as much overhead and, and bills to pay and all those different things. Um, so I, I may have been a little on the cheaper side at the beginning. Um, so that possibly helped us get our foot in the door. Um, but even today, like that, that's kind of our pricing model is to um, be be in the middle there. You know, you bring up a topic that I've heard agencies talk about, uh, which is legacy clients. Um, and the ones that start, sometimes I have found people have a hard time going back. They started off maybe with much cheaper pricing, right? They were younger, they, like you said, 
there's less overhead, you're doing the work, you don't have to pay other people, there's a lot of factors involved. How do you handle that as you grow and maybe you you upgrade the level of service and upgrade what you're doing as well to have that conversation with that client that maybe is paying, whatever, I'm making like 200 a month and now you're, you know, the new client's coming in and you're charging 2000 a month. Like what, what do mm-hmm. those conversations look like as you grew with some of those legacy clients? Yeah. Um, one of the, the prices that it hasn't changed a lot, but Google has always kind of increased their pricing for Google Workspace. Um, our pricing is at par with what Google offers because we're a partner, so we get a little bit of a percentage. So we just offer exactly what you see on if you go to Google Workspace and, and see the pricing. So when their pricing goes up, we get a little heads up and then we send out the, the same kind of message of, hey, customers, uh, great news. Google is going to be increasing your pricing. You know, they haven't done it in so long. And these are the reasons why they're telling us they're doing it. So um, for some of those things, it's it's kind of you just have to bite your lip and, and go on with it because you're not going to really change out your email system for, uh, you know, a 10 percent increase on pricing or something. Um, but in other cases, we we kind of have grandfathered our clients in uh, to pricing. So um, SEO, we, we have some clients that have been doing SEO for like five years on, on a set price. Um, and if that same client were to come to us today, it would probably be at least two, maybe three times more than what it is, you know, what they're, char- uh, they're, they're paying right now. Um, you know, like I look at it as they helped us grow our business. Um, sure, we're not going to be making the margins we are with our new clients, but uh, we still are making enough that I'm not losing on it. Um, and, and I appreciate their business and, and they're good customers too. If they were a customer that wasted my time and, you know, frustrated me and other things like that, then maybe I would be more inclined to uh, tell them the the news that our pricing has gone up by, you know, whatever the the, the percentage might be. But uh, we've been kind of uh, blessed with having good clients and, and ones that we're very happy to keep around. So I don't really see the need to uh, bring up a reason to have a discussion of why, you know, why, what's the reason for the price or upgrade or this or that. So um, your philosophy yeah, is more like, lucky. yeah, the grandfather I'm in and I have the same philosophy as you, Ryan, you know, they helped us along the journey. They came in at a certain period of time and they get to benefit from that. Right. And so I, mm-hmm. I totally hold that sentiment as long as, like you said, you're not losing money. I mean, cause I've seen some people, they have legacy clients and then when they do the calculations, they're actually losing money. Well, you can't, can't do that. But, um, you know, niche, we were talking about this before we record. That's a big topic in the agency world is niche. And you've helped a lot of different types of companies. And um, I know one of the niches that you've been focusing in on is property management companies. So talk about how you made the decision to do that and niche there. Yeah, so it, I've always kind of been looking for a niche and um, it, it's never really come to us very easily. If you look at our portfolio, we've done pretty much everything and probably two or three of the same things of everything. Um, but recently, we have found a little bit of a niche um, with property management companies. Um, and some of the reasons is a lot of them are kind of outdated or or just kind of old and stale looking um, and they need a refreshed brand and look. Um, I, I would say kind of since COVID, I mean, websites have now become the first impression uh, people get in a lot of cases. They'll go to the website before they visit the store. Or they'll go to the website before they contact the person or go meet the person or whatever the case may be. So that that website is really your first impression. If it's dull or boring, that person might just move on to the next site until they're more inspired. And then they do pick up the phone or make an action or go to the store, um, whatever that next step may be. So um, a lot of property management 
websites are in kind of stale looking. Um, so they they're all kind of seem to be in that same time uh, area where they're they're a bit over the hill with their current site and they need something new. Um, and it needs to look good. It needs to sell to their uh, prospective audience. And then we've also been working really hard with a, a software provider that all of these uh, property management companies use, which is called Yardi. And Yardi takes care of all a lot of the admin or all of the admin that some of these property management companies do of uh, holding all the information for all the units, taking care of payments, taking care of um, uh, residence requests and, and all those things that go along with condo buildings, apartment buildings um, and rental properties. So um, we're able to build a, a beautiful professional website and then we're able to pull in all that data that's up in Yardi and put the two together so the our clients have a you know a really professional website and it functions well and it really acts as as kind of a a 24 7 salesperson because it's able to show the user what units are available what the pictures look like what's the floor plan what's the price and press a button to uh you know book a showing or or even put in a, an offer on it so um, that, that's been a really cool niche that we've been working on lately is the property management company. Another one is government contracts. Yeah, so that's been a really fun project. We started our, our first government contract doing uh, all the websites for Simcoe County. Um, and and so we, we built this website right here for, for Simcoe County. and. And it, it was a lot of content, a lot of text. And, and so we came in to make this site look and be appealing to users, make content more bite-sized, make it more easy to read, make it easier to find as well. Um, so those were some of our objectives. And um, I think we really nailed them all of, of making it a, a great, easy to navigate website, easy to find the, the topics people are looking for. Um, ability to put out the news and show off projects. Um, and then we also did six other websites for them. So we did the Simcoe Museum, the Simcoe Tourism, Simcoe Economic Development, Simcoe Regional Airport, um, Immigration Services. Um, so all those sites yeah, at the bottom there um, were also part of the project. So it, it really took us into a uh, um, uh, a, a vast project and working with a lot of different uh, stakeholders and, and putting together different visions for each group. Um, and yeah, it was a really good project. And uh, the last thing about it is is the accessibility with all the government websites these days and, and a lot of other websites that we do. Uh, website accessibility is, is kind of uh, top of mind. Um, so we were also able to uh, show off all our website accessibility skills that we've been refining over the last few years as well. I feel like, Ryan, uh, government site is kind of a beast because there's so much content. There's so many different things. Like I'm even looking at the, you know, the homepage and there's like, okay, we need maps. We need transit. We need housing. There's so much info. Yes. And it must be, I've heard with government stuff, it's it's really a lot of labor to get the actual, you know, contract with it. What was that process like? Yeah, they can be like 50 to 60 page long RFP. Um, so a lot of reading. Um, good news is if you're ever going to try them, usually the wording starts to become a bit repetitive as you go through 10 or 12 of them and, and start your submissions. But yeah, it's it's a lot of work to submit those RFPs. Um, you know, the first few that we did probably took me six hours, eight hours to complete. And your chances of getting them are, are kind of low because they do have requirements of you've had to work with government before. So to get that foot in the door is a little difficult. Um, but, you know, now that we have it, hopefully will be a little easier to get a few more. Um, and, and now that we've probably submitted 30 plus of these RFPs, we've kind of built ourselves a little database. 
So when there's a question in one of those RFPs, we can almost search our database of how did we answer this question to a past RFP, um, find the answer, make sure it looks good, tweak it a little bit, and then pull it into our RFP. So it, once, once you do a few of them, it becomes a little easier, but you are right. They are a long read and you need a couple cups of coffee to get through of it. I'm wondering why did you even do it in the first place? Because I'm thinking, okay, you talk to a plumber. They're like, Ryan, sign me up. Right? Easy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you're like, well, now I could do a 50 to 60 page RFP. It takes me eight hours. What made you decide to even go that route? Um, I think it's just because it seemed... So at the end of the day, I look at it where it's a 50 page RFP and there's maybe 30 to 40 companies that I constantly see bidding on them. And then you can also see how many of those companies actually submitted the RFP. So you'll have about 40 that register for the bid. You'll have maybe 10 to 15 that submit the bid. So I looked at kind of the odds of 10 to 15, you know, I have your poker maybe, days came uh, up. You're 10, looking yeah, at my, the yeah, yeah, my, my poker hand was telling me I have a 10% chance of winning this pot. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I looked at. Um, just the odds were there. So we kept on pushing and we eventually won a few and, and now we have some good stories. Now you're share. hooked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another one just to highlight a little bit more about what you do. Um, this, uh, flooring company, uh, what'd you do with them? Yeah, so this is Alexanian. Um, they have about 20 or 30 brick and mortar stores where they sell flooring, rugs, carpet, laminate, vinyl, hardwood, um, window coverings, and, and kind of all that type of material and products. Um, so we, we built an online e-commerce store for them. And we've done many, many e-commerce stores. And, and some, I would say, would be maybe a, a bit more flashy and, and cooler designs and stuff like that. But this is a very simple, basic e-commerce site, very easy to find things, filter things, search for things. And one of the biggest things that I like to highlight for this site is there was about 35,000 SKUs that we uh, upload into the site. It's got resources where you can take a picture of your living room and upload it into the website so you can see the carpet or the flooring, how it would look on your space. Um, it's got inventory management system to it. Um, it's connected to social media ads, Google ads. It, it's really kind of uh, one of our examples of an e-commerce store that is totally, I wouldn't say self-managed, but it, it's connected to everything that's taking a lot of admin work and daily updates and, and work off of the company's uh, internal team. So the website really is doing as much as it possibly can on its own as a website um, and helping improve sales uh, online. Did you have to revamp the whole site or did you have to build it from scratch, like on a separate platform? What were they using from like the, the management system for the, for the e-commerce? Um, so they were on a, a e-commerce platform previous and it had problems to it. Um, it was difficult to, to learn. So internally, you know, getting anyone new on board to figure out how things worked was a bit of a nightmare. Um, and because it had issues, it was costing a lot just to continually fix it and update it. Um, I mean, it, it was a bit of a bit of a headache. So um, we came in and, and offered a, a simple solution. Um, this site's built on WordPress and WooCommerce. Um, I think that's the most popular one out there overall, probably because it's built yeah. on WordPress. Yeah. And so a lot of our sites are. Was WordPress it on Magento based. before? Or what were they using? Do you remember? Uh, it wasn't Magento, okay. but uh, I can't remember what it was, but okay. it was kind of a big name. Um, uh, CRM as well with it, but I, I can't remember. Yeah. Off but you like uh, WordPress and WooCommerce. I, I do like it. Um, 
I like it because, you know, it's been around forever. So there, there's definitely a reason why. And it's because it's easy to use in the back end. It offers complete customization. There's no limits to it. Um, and it's it's open source, meaning it's it's free, other than you do have to pay for hosting and you do have to maintain it and update it. Um, but other than that, like you're not, there's no licensing fee to it or, or any contract like that. Um, and also, you know, I don't selfishly try to lock people into you're going to work with us for the next 10 years of your life. Uh, I, I kind of promote that if you choose WordPress and we build the site, but for some reason you no longer want to work with us, you'll be able to find a handful of agencies that will be able to assist you because everyone knows how to work with WordPress. So I kind of even use that as a selling tool um, just to kind of show that we're not trying to lock you into any contracts or anything. The reason I, I like this is for SEO and uh, the ability to edit, but also just so you know, anyone else would be able to manage this site. What mistakes do you see people make on their website, Ryan? Because I'm sure they come to you um, and like, here's what we got, right? Um, what are some of the elements that are a must and what are some of the mistakes you see companies making with their site? Um, so some of the mistakes I see often um, are just too much words and just no call to action on a, on a page. So it, again, like I said that a website's really, especially these days, like a, your first impression of a company. So when you land on that site and if it's, it's not uh, engaging you or, or promoting or, or making some sort of feeling of excitement in you, um, it, it's failing. Uh, Cause you really need to make that good first impression. Um, and then have good call to action. So it pushes people to really where you want them to go. So like our site, this is an old site, 10 years old, but it's still still kicking. It's still doing what it needs to do. We have call to actions all over, right in your face, get started, get in touch. You click on those, it's going to start taking you to a request form. Yep. Um, That's a good one. I've gone to many, many sites. sites where you know, you go and you're scrolling and scrolling. It's not really guiding me to do anything, right? But you could see with yours, exactly, yeah. there's get in touch, there's get started. If we go to um, this one here, obviously there's a shop now, there's a direct, obviously with e-commerce, it's essential to have a call to action. So that's a good one. What else, what other mistakes do people make? Um, I see a lot done on SEO. Um, so and even developers or whoever builds the site, they build it, it looks good, they're done. But there's a lot of things you should be doing before you can say you're done. Um, and, and for SEO, it's as simple as putting a title on the website. So if you build a site and just say you're done, by default, it's probably the title of that website is gonna say either home or it might say the company name. But at the end of the day, you're not telling Google or other search engines. You can see on yours you right do. here, it's when I hover over websites, designs, and SEO services, and then good or marketing. And so, yeah. So we've set up a title on that page that tells Google what we do. We do web design and internet marketing. Um, so we see it so many times where uh, a, a company or a client will come to us and say, like, no one comes to my site, no one can find it. And I look at it and I see, well, your title says home. If you if I went to a library and I was looking for a book on how to hang a door and I came across your book and it said home, I wouldn't pick it up. I would pick up the book that says how to hang a door for dummies or something like that. So, again, if, if you don't put a title on your page. Uh, you're not telling Google or people, so they'll just avoid it because they don't know what's inside. So that is the easiest thing. It takes 10 seconds to do, but often gets overlooked. Talk about the evolution of the team. When you first started, it's you, right? You're shaking hands at networking groups. How did the yeah. team evolve? Yeah, so um, it started with me, and I did have a developer as well that I kind of started the the company with, and and that developer I met while I was doing the online poker and and those type of websites. So um, we kind of just transitioned into what we were doing now. Um, that developer still 
um, works with us today. Uh, they actually live in Australia. So that's kind of been a, an advantage as well to our service offering, because if you call us at five or six o'clock on Thursday uh, at night, I can just flip it over to our colleague in Australia and it's 8.30 in the morning for him. So he's ready and eager You're to telling the to clients, work. I drink coffee all night. I, we stayed up all <laughs> night working on this and 8 a.m. is ready. Yeah, so we are able to uh, surprise our clients and, and kind of look really good when um, a client you know, is, has something break at the end of the day. They can come back in the morning and sometimes be very surprised that, hey, it's magically fixed. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty cool. Our, our, my my first employee is still with us. So that's, again, like a 15 year relationship. Um, from there, we, uh, I think, hired another developer. And then after that, we hired someone to help us with marketing. And then we hired maybe another developer. Then we brought on a project manager just because with three developers and a, and a um, marketing person, the workload got bigger and more than just I could handle. So a project manager came in to help out balance and and keep the uh, the workflow going and, and make sure deadlines and deliverables were met. Um, and then from there, we've just kind of hired a few more developers and, and uh, marketing people. And um, somewhere in the middle of that story, there was also a designer that we hired um, full time. We were kind of contracting out design a lot just because at the time it didn't make sense to have a full time good, good designer on staff. Um, but as we grew to a, a stage where we definitely could support a full time graphic designer, that's that's when we made the move to bring someone on for that. Ryan, um, what software you mentioned, obviously, as you grew, you kind of professionalized, got project manager to help coordinate. What are some of the softwares you use internally to manage the agency? So um, Google Workspace, we, we've always been on uh, as a Google client. Um, that, that helps us out so much. All our documents are in Google Drive. I can share it with all our um, colleagues and staff. Um, it has everything for spreadsheets and Google Docs, um, email. We also use Google Chat. You know, a lot of times agencies, uh, they all use Slack and all these things, but we've pretty much stayed everything Google, just kept it all in one spot. Um, and then we, we've we gone through a few different project management tools. But the what, last... what ones have you gone through and what are you on now? Uh, we're on a project management tool called Write currently um and and we've been happy with them it does everything that we need um we've been on a few others in, in the past and i honestly can't even remember their names but we've been on right for at least five six years um and so that's what we use for project management um and then you know we have a few other tools for um invoicing and and um accounting and and things like that but for the most part it's just google and and reich and that gives us everything that we need what do you use for invoicing um i love fresh books and i don't love change which i hate saying out loud um uh, accountants they love quickbooks so i have both i have fresh books that i use to send out invoices and then our bookkeeper and accountant it pulls everything into QuickBooks where they like to have it. Yeah. I mean, you want to make it easy for you, but I get it. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, first of all, Ryan, I have one last question before I ask it. Uh, I just want to point people to check out your site, um, goodermarketing.com to learn more. You can check out more episodes on inspiredinsider.com. And just thanks for sharing your journey uh, my last question, Ryan, is about resources, some of your favorite resources. It could be uh, books, it could be podcasts, it could be just mentors that have helped you uh, in the journey. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any one particular resource. Um, I mean, I, I listen to a number of podcasts and they're not even all business related like some are even fantasy football related and but some are kind of marketing related um 
Yeah, I, I th there is no one resource I can really point to, but there's been so many things that have, I've, I've come across from either people saying or doing. Um, I think for me, the number one thing is, is talking people, even if they're in your same competitive industry, like it doesn't matter what business you're in, you're probably going to have competitors. At the beginning, I was like afraid to even talk to them. Like I wanted to avoid them and I'm just going to crush them somehow. But uh, I kind of quickly learned actually talking to your competitors, they're going through the same problems. Sometimes they, they're already burdened with the work even, and they'll be like, hey, can you just take this project? Um, and so, yeah, I guess talking to kind of competitors and just other business owners is where I've learned a lot of uh, helpful information. And I also do kind of like to share that information with other business owners too. Of, you know, I use FreshBooks to do invoicing. If you're still using spreadsheets, maybe you should try something like that. It will save you a lot of time. Um, yeah. Love it. Ryan, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey, knowledge. Everyone can check out goodermarketing.com or episodes of the podcast, and we'll see everyone next time. And Ryan, thanks so much. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.